Hi everybody, what an amazing venue. I just got back from doing a similar talk in San Francisco and it was like this box room for three days where I didn't see light. And I come here, I saw her outside and I was tempted to not even come in actually because it's such an amazing view. So uh, I focus on financial services and uh, all things around digital innovation, transformation. And that ranges from really, really big players like Goldman Sachs, Citi, et cetera, JP Morgan, to fintechs, to payment providers, uh, local big players, and even local regional players. No matter how big or small they are, the same questions come every single time. And the question is, how do I look at what's coming in terms of disruption and change my organization, and ideally do a little bit of disrupting, and then how do I drive uh, customer first mindsets? How do I be more customer centric? Same questions every time. So that's all I focus on. And I guess there are many answers to the first question around how you transform yourself and what you need to do. Uh, and I think one of those is around fixing the customer centricity. But truthfully, when I look at these organizations, in nearly every scenario, they say they've done some things around customer centricity. And when I do a quote unquote audit, I realize it's sort of lip service. They're saying the words, they have the titles, they have a team, they have some beanbags and t-shirts for sure. Like they're, they're the obligatory things, right? But we haven't really changed. And so I wanna share with you some of the things that I go through with them uh, in terms of what I've seen others do really well, what I've seen big tech do really well, not just Amazon, but many of the big tech players. So I'll share this, I'm around for Q and A and then I'm around all afternoon as well. So the first thing I see in financial services is we do have the beanbags and we have the t-shirts and we have the innovation arm, but ultimately when it comes to thinking about products, we still have this view of a, either a system centric view, our systems can do this thing, so this is what I'm gonna give you. You know, our, our core banking has these limitations, so this is what you get. Um, our, our app can only do this, so this is what you get. Uh, you know, we have all of these limitations and you know, the topic a moment ago about data was really interesting. Data only allows us to do this, so this is what you get. And obviously there are rules you have to comply with and there are policies and compliance. But from a customer's perspective, I don't care about any of those things. I don't care about your core banking solution. I don't care about your org constraints. I don't care about your inability to be able to share things between and allow me to have sort of one view of the world, right? So that's the first limitation I see. And then the second limitation is, we still talk in terms of banking products. We still say like, we want to sell you this, uh, this credit product. We want to sell you this, uh, this loan solution. We want to sell you this insurance. And customers don't really think that way, right? They, they don't wake up in the morning and say, I really want this loan product. You know, that's not the way they think. So we need to get away from that mindset to more like the right hand side of this, where we start to think about uh, deep customer needs. And I'm gonna talk a bit more about this in the following slides, but what are those sort of underlying <laughs> needs? And we've been doing this for a while. So most firms have, have a vernacular around this, they talk in this way, but what they do is they do the research and then they go back to the left-hand side and then they just go back to their products again. So they have all this research that says, you know, Emma's 24 and she needs this thing, well, I'm gonna push my CASA solutions. And like, there's no linkage between them. Uh, because you know, we just want to sort of tick the box. So that's what I find very often. The other thing is firms that do this really well, inside or outside of financial services, they do a ton of experiments. Broadly speaking, the one thing I learned from Amazon, and this is true for any of the successful tech firms is, and it's kind of obvious, the more experiments you do, the more interesting products you have at the bottom, right? Like a funnel. And so those firms have got really good at building uh, this mechanism to do lots of experiments and do them in safe ways. You know, they're not sort of taking huge risks, even they don't like downtime and outages, etc. But then have this sort of mechanism to have lots of that going on, have mechanisms to get rid of the not interesting things, the things that are off of strategy, the things that clearly won't work. But at the end of that, you get to this output of huge uh, you know, changes in the organization because you've got this big funnel of things coming in at the top. But to do that, you need to be okay with things failing, things not happening the way you expected them to happen. I always say, and I've stolen this from Jeff Bezos, if you know the outcome before you start, that's not really an experiment, right? And I think in financial services, there's often this view, 
we can't really start this project because we're not very clear on what the output's going to look like. Well, then that's not an experiment, right? That's a project. That's a, you know, you have a Gantt chart, you have some risks you manage. That's not an experiment. So my advice to the industry generally is we need to figure out how we get this funnel of opportunities and new experiments going. And I'm not a big believer in that happening outside of the core business, actually. I'm not a fan of sort of the separate innovation labs because I feel like broadly they've been too disconnected from the businesses. So that's kind of the opening gambit. So I said a moment ago, I don't think anybody wakes up and sort of talks about the, the credits uh, you know, requirement. So my view is in the world going forward, there's sort of seven core needs that we have. And I'm sure there's others, this isn't exhaustive, but I guarantee nobody in the morning here in this room wakes up and goes, man, I wish I had another insurance product. Like I'd love to just talk to my relationship manager today. That's, that's gonna make me happy. Like that just doesn't happen, right? And so as you look across these needs, the reality is, no matter what segment you're in, no matter what part of the world you live in, how affluent you are, you're probably thinking, I need to plan for my family's future. And that means sort of care for my parents, that means uh, schooling for my children, that means where do I retire. I guarantee these days you're thinking, I need to get from one place to another. You know, I need, I need the Uber, or I need to take the train to this place, I need to get around you're probably thinking, I'd really like to learn something as well. You know, we're finding these days that there's this sort of notion of constant learning. I want to learn how to do a new skill. I want to pivot my career. So there's all of these things that sort of drive our needs and our wants. And we know they're there. I've not said anything that's revolutionary to you. But the firms that do really well around this, they major on these things. They major on how can I embed myself in your daily lifestyle around these things. It's not about taking you out of these things and selling you a CASA product. It's about how can I take my solutions and make them work so that they embed into these points of your daily life. And I'm sure there's others that aren't even mentioned here, but firms that can embed their payment solutions in how you do um, shopping, healthcare, learning, those sorts of things, we're gonna see more and more of that. I'll talk about a couple of examples of that today. So I mentioned the word audit when I go and talk to customers. It's not really an audit. I ask them these three questions and I ask it consistently of a number of teams. And I find very quickly we get to, we don't really have the right sort of customer first mindset. So I wanna share them with you and I'll give some examples along the way. And before I start, I'll give an example inside the industry and an example outside the industry close to home of firms that I think do this really, really well. So inside the industry, I live in Singapore, I would say DBS does this exceptionally well and I'll give some examples of how they do it well along the way. And then closer to home, outside the industry, Qantas does this very well. And th this applies to any industry, but when we think about uh, how they think about customers and what I'm about to say, they do this really well. So the first is, who actually is the customer we're trying to service? I have this, I think it used to be a controversial view, I think it's not such a controversial view now, that traditional segmentation is dead. This idea of sort of 18 to 24 year olds, 25 to 30 something, any firm that is still doing their product ideation, their product builds based on that, is in a scary place, frankly. And there's still lots of them doing it, but you know, it's just common sense that the difference between an 18-year-old and a 24-year-old in terms of their need, their access to tech, what they're buying, their daily patterns, is hugely different. Like, it's hugely different. And the same from 25 to 30-something. So you're finding consistently that the firms that do really good product development, that have great innovation, that have the financial performance that links to this sort of behavior, they built personas. And so rather than 18 to 24, they've said, who is a customer that we believe really, really, really we want to serve? And you can be data driven around that. So you can say, we've looked at our base, or we've looked at the population of Sydney, we've looked at this growing urban millennial population as an example, and you can say that's a persona that I want to service. And even that is big, so then you say let's get a bit more specific. Urban millennials, which bit of that do we want to service? Which bit of it is really important to us? And you'll get a specific as saying, Emma is 24, she works in this profession, 
here's our hopes, dreams and fears and all the other things that you see typically on personas. And I'll tell you now, because I've done this for years and years and years, it seems so easy to write one of those. It seems like you could spend 30 minutes and you could write a persona. I'll tell you consistently what I do is I work with customers first to say, well, let's do some data uh, you know, review so we can figure out who is this persona. Because in the room, we'd all have different views of who that persona is, and that happens in every org. So we take a while to get to the right persona, and then we'd write one. And then I always challenge my customers. Typically in banking, I say, let's go out to a shopping mall or some public location, and let's try and find the person that you've just drawn up. And I'll tell you, on average, it takes six to 10 iterations to you can consistently find that person. Only when you can consistently find that person have you got the persona right in terms of what they want, their behaviors. And I don't ever do anything in terms of building or strategy or sort of business planning until I've got this bit right. And so DBS does this really well because in Singapore, they have a place where they have on the wall about 17 personas from memory and they've changed management around these personas, so they never change without a thorough check that the person has really changed. And they do change because they get married and go on to do other things, and they either take them out the persona group because they're no longer somebody they're targeting, or they evolve that persona. But the first question that the CEO asks, Piyush, he says, who is the persona we're targeting, and when did you last validate that this person is who we think they are? That's question number one. That kills a ton of ideas because people come with third party research and data they've got off the internet, even data internally. If they can't answer this, then don't go to the room. Don't ask for money. The second one is, if you're coming to me with an idea, so you've now validated that Emma is Emma, she's 24 and all of her needs are still the same and she's still in the same position. How have you validated that this thing you're bringing to me, this payment solution, this, uh, this, this credit line, this, um, this education, whatever it is you're bringing, how have you validated that they actually want this? And it's not enough to say, I've done some research again. You need to go to your personas and run tests and run experiments around what they want. And so again, if you go to Pius at DBS, and there's many that do this, Qantas again do this very well, they'll say, what have you actually done? Show me the tests to suggest that this is a pain point for them today, that actually if we uh, didn't do this, that it's hurting them in some way. And if we do this, it solves that problem in some way. And then through the experiments you've ran where you tested that you know, this is an urgent pain, this isn't sort of a nice to have, this is something that's actually gonna change their, their, their behaviors, this is gonna save them time, this is gonna save them money, this is going to delight them in some way. They're gonna, you know, because we all have our apps on our phones that we love. So if you can be that sort of, uh, you can delight them in the way that they're using digital solutions. What did you learn about this? Did you learn that this is a three times a week interaction? Is this a five times a day interaction? Is this gonna save them time? Is this gonna reduce their fears? I spoke about the, the seven things that we concern ourselves with. You know, what did you learn? And so, if you're in the room with Pius from DBS and he's asked you those questions, how certain are we that it's Emma? How certain are we that these pain points are real pain points and that they matter to her? And through the experiments, what did we learn that would inform us going or not going with this? Those questions, if driven down through the leadership team are hugely important because I found they, they kill a lot of ideas that probably should never get to the table. And they sort of build this very simple framework for anybody that's coming up with new solutions to be thinking, if I can't answer these, then I need to go and do that before I start designing and building solutions. There's always this temptation to ask for some tech spend and ask for some IT to help and some developers and all of the rest of that. I say answer these before you get anywhere near that because you might just kill your own idea. So what's changed in society that sped up this need for us to be digitizing, for us to be more customer centric? Actually, I put it into three buckets and I'm gonna talk about the left and the right hand ones first and then I'll talk about the middle. The left hand side, you know, ultimately, we're seeing this concept of uh, kind of the gig economy. We're seeing that uh, you know, people are living longer. We're seeing people traveling more. We're seeing um, a greater population moving to urban areas. 
We're seeing um, job mobility within the companies, within the industries, becoming more and more commonplace. Not fast enough, in my opinion, but we're seeing you know, kind of women driving uh, leadership and rising up into key positions. And actually, I, I did a study about two years back with a friend from Cambridge that showed organizations that have uh, women ascending to leadership positions faster tend to have greater internal disruption and lead to greater uh, digital sort of transformation. And it's just because they challenge the conventional thinking more. So what I say to organizations when they talk about diversity is it shouldn't be diversity for the sake of it. The stats that show this thinking tends to lead to better digital outcomes. On the right hand side, boy, are we servicing for different types of customers now and every generation that goes. I did a study in, uh, it was actually in the US a while back with Harvard, and I went to some graduates and I said, what do you think the working life is gonna be like for you in the future? And they were just graduating. And I said, look, just tell me anything. Tell me, what are you thinking? And what surprised me is they were really consistent around one point. Uh, I said, what do you think your career will be like? And they said, well, we're not gonna have one career. We're gonna have many. And I was, in the end, I sort of ran a poll and said, how many careers do you think you're having? Because I think I've had one career. And the viewers, they think they're gonna have about five careers. And they're gonna change those careers dramatically. And I picked on one person in the room to say, I wanna understand what you mean by a career, because maybe we mean different things. And so there was somebody that just qualified uh, or just finished their law degree. And they were so clear about what this life is gonna be like for them. Yeah, who knows whether it will really translate or not, but very clear and much more thought out than I ever was. And so they said, well, I'm probably gonna go and practice law for the first kind of six or seven years. But then what I want to do is I really want to go into a, uh, you know, the equivalent of a FinTech in the legal world. I wanna go into like a tech company and I wanna disrupt law. And they've already mapped this out. Like they wanna go and learn how to do law, then they wanna go and kind of uh, you know, build an app that takes away all the lawyers. Not quite that, but you know, it's that sort of thing. And they said, but that's probably gonna teach me a lot of skills, but not necessarily uh, make me rich or make me very fulfilled. So then I wanna go and help uh, in, you know, in really poor environments. I wanna go to Africa or help in these emerging market locations where I can sort of upskill the local population and use technology to help them scale how they build better frameworks. So then we've gone from you know, private practice or you know, practicing law to disrupting law to this is now my social purpose phase. Um, and then they said, well, at some point I need to make some money, so then I'll probably go back and either start my own business, and this is my entrepreneurial phase, or I'll go into a corporate, uh, but I wanna go into a corporate that's doing interesting things around culture and digital, and I want to be a really cool lawyer within that organization. And they said, I probably wanna end up in big tech, because I'll have learned a lot of things along the way. So this was their career. And what I didn't find was anybody that said, I, I just want to be a lawyer forever. You know, I just want to go into a company and make partner and uh, you know, make lots of money. Nobody said anything remotely like that, which either means we'll have lots of poor people or lots of happy people. But uh, you know, it was really, really interesting. The other thing I took away from it was lots of people said, I probably am going to have a career that makes me less money than people generations before but I think I want to have this balance of doing a few things at the same time. And so this concept of the gig economy came up and there was a person saying, um, I want to go into the insurance industry, but I also plan to drive an Uber. And I plan to do the same, uh, you know, both at the same time. And then I have this little uh, sort of entrepreneurial vision that's nothing to do with either of those. And I'm definitely gonna pursue that. And they've only just qualified, right? So it's crazy that they've already got this planned out. They're already driving the Uber. They're already starting the entrepreneurial things. They said, if anything I'm gonna drop, it's gonna be the career in insurance. And so, you know, trying to service that, that customer base means a few things. It means, you know, I suspect all of their plans will change dramatically over the next 20, 30 years, and it will be nothing like quite what they expected but I feel fairly confident there will also be nothing quite like our careers and what we've done. And even if it's not five careers, it will be two or three. And the other thing I feel is they're entirely digital, right? The idea of going into a branch to do anything, the idea of having this face-to-face uh, this -face relationship. One of them joked, um, 
you know, I don't talk to my girlfriend face to face. Our relationship is through WhatsApp and Facebook and every other digital solution. Why would I want to go to a branch to talk to you? Like, and it really kind of struck me that we just won't reach these people unless we have these solutions. And it wasn't about how fancy the app was. It was just, I want the ability to do this thing, and I want to not have to go and talk to you. And I don't think, and nowhere along the way did people say, bankers are really bad, I can't stand insurance. It wasn't about you, so I think it's, don't think about yourselves, think about just how they want to behave, right? They're not sitting there saying, man, banking sucks. They're saying, I just don't want to leave my house. I build my business in my bedroom, I don't get dressed, I'm not going to the branch. And then finally, the tech piece. Everybody, when they talk about digital transformation, talks about how tech is changing the world. The truth is, and I'm a tech person that sort of moved into digital, all of these things in the middle column have been around for a long time. You know, they aren't really new. You may not be using them. You may not be using, uh, you know, machine learning. But actually, machine learning dates back decades, yeah? Like, these things have been there. Even IoT, we have this sort of funky name for it now. But sensors have been around for a while. What makes this different now is that you've got the things on the left and the right hand side happening. And the bit in the middle has become really accessible and really, really affordable. Because now anybody that's doing anything interesting in this space is not spending tens of millions of dollars on buying compute, um, buying big data technology. They're all leveraging software as a service or cloud solutions so that they can do all of these things and have the same capabilities that Netflix has or Atlassian or Google or Amazon. So the playing field has been leveled. So I say to my customers, you're unlikely to win based on the middle column because everybody has access to it. Whether you're a local regional bank here or Goldman Sachs, you can all go into Amazon and have the same technology and you pay exactly the same price and you get it at the same speed. So there shouldn't be the thing that you hinge your success on and it shouldn't break you either. I mean, clearly you have to be doing the right things. If you ignored all those things in the middle column, you're probably not going to do so well. But it's accessible to everybody. So I say don't sort of maniacally focus on the tech either. Focus on the left and the right hand side. So this gentleman said about 10 years back, people don't need banks anymore, they need banking. And incredibly smart guy, clearly smarter than I will ever be. But actually with the wisdom of hindsight, I'd actually say he's wrong. Because what we've seen pop up in other markets is these new digital only banks. If I think about Starling or Monzo, there's some coming here. But the truth is, despite them being around for a long time and getting lots of uh, attention and getting you know, reasonable customer amounts, they're nowhere near profitable, generally. And if you look at the pattern of most customers that are using them, they don't really use them as their main account. Like, they really rarely use them as their main account. They'd love them to. But what happens with Starling, as an example, in the UK, is you move over sort of a thousand pounds or you know, you know two thousand dollars, and you use it as your secondary account, and you use it daily, but it's not your main account, and so it's not the account where you sort of arrange uh, a mortgage, for example, or a car loan, you know, those big credit items, but it is the account where you do most of your daily transactions. So it is hurting the incumbents because you, you're seeing one transaction out to that other account. And then you're not seeing all of the data around how they're behaving. So it is hurting the organizations. But when it comes to saying people don't need banks, the truth is I expected 10 years ago that we'd see some big names sort of drop away and we'd see some of these new digital players just sort of take over and become the biggest banks in a country or a region. That hasn't happened. And so what I say to my customers who tend to be the incumbents is actually I don't think it's that people don't need banks, they need banking. I think actually we've just got this very short window where we need banks to be much better. We need banks to be much better at doing all of this. Because I heard the speaker before me talk about trust. Despite all of the challenging things in the banking industry, you still have more trust than those newer firms. But you, this window is closing where the newer wave of generations sort of, you know, they place less importance on trust. 
you know, and it's only because they haven't had a big event in their lives where they've had to question the trust around their bank so much. But right now, if the functionality is there with these newer players and they're coming into the industry and they've only ever known a Starling or a Monzo, et cetera, they'll put their trust with them. So we have this window where we need to provide similar solutions or we will never reverse this cycle, I think. But that window is really, really closing. I think it's, you know, I think it's five years and in five years, if you haven't pivoted to something that's a lot like those solutions, then the trust argument will be a very wafer thin one to, to you know, compete with those firms. So I see two scenarios uh, in terms of how you can think about becoming a, a daily life partner. You remember I spoke about those seven, uh, those seven things that people think about in their daily lives. So the first is, you know, people use this phrase of going beyond banking. And this is a screenshot of WeChat in China. And what's interesting about WeChat is it's, it's much like WhatsApp or any other social media <laughs> solution. But because it comes from Tencent, you know, there's all of these things within the group that they do, whether it's WeBank, you know, a bank, whether it's payments, whether it's e-commerce, you know, there's just a ton of things they do, healthcare, insurance. And so they've embedded all of these things in the app. So it's so simple to get credit, to get insurance, to buy things online. And it's all there in one place. And so when I'm talking to incumbents and I, they talk about building digital solutions and how they're going to actually acquire customers, I mean, obviously you should service your own customers first, but I often say one, one solution for you know, acquiring the customers is actually to embed in other people's solutions. Figure out what are those sort of viral solutions that everybody's going to use and try and embed your solutions into those so then it is part of their daily life. You know, I wouldn't try and pretend you're not a bank. Right? You are a bank or a payment solution provider, but where can you embed it in their, in their Uber journey or in their, uh, in their Grab journey if you're in Southeast Asia or in you know, their process of going to the hospital? Try and think about that when you're going beyond banking. So that was a video of a digital solution that Royal Bank of Scotland has just launched called Bow, which is a separate, entirely separate brand entity bank. The only ties back to the existing bank are they're using the existing license and funding comes from the existing bank and there's connectivity at the board level, otherwise entirely separate. So no products, um, none of the technology comes across from it. 
Uh, and there's a bunch of these coming out, but they believe they're one of the first incumbents to really do a completely separate organization. There's been a few in the US that haven't gone so well, but certainly one of the first. What's interesting about that is when they did the customer research, and we, we did it with them, and we did all of what I described. We went out to talk to a bunch of customers, and they thought initially they weren't going to go for um, millennials. They were going to go for people that were a bit older because they were convinced that's where the money is. And we did the research. We realized that people didn't like their brand. They didn't want to bank with them. Uh, you know, just Generally, they didn't want to bank with them, but certainly not in a digital solution. So then we pivoted to a few different personas, and then we got to this persona. But what was interesting about this persona, two things came out of it that we just never thought you would hear. The first was... We're all about social causes. So if there's a way that my digital bank can inform me about social causes and allow me to easily siphon off some of my money towards social causes, causes every day or every month when my pay comes in, that would be great. That was like one of their number one demands. And we were obviously pushing kind of credit products and you know, insurance and do you want a bank account? And they were telling us this. And the second thing they said consistently is, it's really annoying, this is in the UK, but you know, the utility uh, providers here treat us really badly and we feel like we're getting ripped off and it's really hard to move between them and we just, it's so complex, we don't know what options are out there. And so in the end we said, well, what if we could solve that? What if we could sort of aggregate what's available and you just put in a little bit of information and we tell you what's available, whether it's telecoms or gas or electricity or other things, and then we make it pretty easy for you to switch. And so, those two things, sort of nothing to do with banking, really, and they have been game changers in their, in their testing and their soft launch around sort of customer acceptance. And neither of them will likely make them any money, to be honest. Uh, but we found it to be the most sticky thing for customers to start using them. And how often will you change a utility? Probably not very often, but you know, hopefully not very often. But even doing it once is a, is a big hook for them. So that's how I think about going beyond banking in that context. Now, the Apple card is an interesting one because I have this uh, phrase I use, utility banking. And when I'm talking to incumbents, I say, you know, you could build a digital bank, you could do what Royal Bank of Scotland did, and you could try and go after lots of customers, but you're either gonna spend a ton on marketing or um, you know, you're just gonna build something magical that everybody's gonna gravitate towards to, but that's, that's pretty tough. And more likely, you're going to spend a lot on marketing and customer acquisition costs will be high, which is exactly what you're trying to avoid with a digital solution. Or you can build something and embed it in other you know, daily life partners, if you like. And so I think the Apple setup is really interesting because that's obviously what Goldman's have done. They built a solution and they found a really big brand name. And they've said, we want you to front it. You have the customer relationships. You have the brand power. We're going to sit behind and we're gonna build this financial services engine to support you with any of the ideation that you drive, we'll support it, but we're okay to sort of be behind the scenes. And I think that hasn't happened so much in the past. Typically, you know, banks want to own the, the customer, want to own the relationship. They think that's really, really important, and I can see why, but I think we're gonna see much more of this. I see this a lot across Asia. How can we build not just credit card solutions, but actually a bank that plugs into ride hailing or e-commerce and I may never own the customer, which means you get into a sort of JV relationship. This isn't like a sort of, everybody talks about ecosystems here. This isn't like you're gonna have lots of these relationships. You're gonna pick a really important partner that has you know, a, route, a channel to customers, that has a great brand, that wants to do more than their core business, and you're gonna sit with them and be their financial services provider. So I think we'll see a lot of this. So, what do I see a lot of in the firms that do this really, really well? I would say one thing I t tell customers is go out and buy a book called Zone to Win. And it's by Jeffrey Moore, who wrote Crossing the Chasm, sort of one of the founding fathers of, of innovation. And the, the background to Zone to Win is it's basically four blocks. It's like a typical consulting diagram. And what I tell them is you need to look at the things you're doing today that actually you don't think are part of your future. Because I think when we talk about innovation, we always think about new things, and let's build a new this, build a new that. A lot of what I say is we need to kill things that we don't need anymore, because they're either a distraction, or we can use that funding and that, that focus and that talent to focus on the new things. So I say, what are we not gonna do anymore? And 
what do we need to continue to do, but we want to be really, really efficient around it? And a, a great example of what would sit in that box is, you know, one of my colleagues used to work uh, in Microsoft and used to own Office as a product before it became Office 365. And the problem with that product at the time is all they knew was when you bought the, the disk or you downloaded it and when you opened and closed it. That's all they knew about you. So they didn't have any data to be able to sort of service you better because they just didn't know anything about customers. And so they had this view, people are going to continue to buy this product, but we want to know a lot more about them. We want to change the models of how we interact with our customers. So they said, we're going to deprecate the way we do office products and we're going to continue to service them. And it's not like people are being made redundant, but we want you to run this into being the most efficient business it can be while we build Office 365. Because at some point, we're phasing out this old model. And so they were very deliberate about what they didn't want to do anymore. And they started stripping it of resources in terms of product development and new ideas and new solutions. And just you know, said, you just run this down until we built this new business, and then you move over to this new business. So be really clear about what you're not going to do anymore. What's not going to help you to win? What's a drag on the business? And I think a lot of the times when we talk about digital transformation, we ignore those hard discussions because they are hard and we just sort of continue to run things. But if you don't do that, then anything you do on the digital side is just going to be an additional cost. The second thing I say is we need to have, like I said at the beginning, this engine of new ideas, this way to incubate new ideas. I'm not a big believer in a separate lab. I'm also a big believer in you need to have a mechanism so that not just any idea gets into that sort of incubation zone. And you need to have a framework, and you need to sort of let people come up with these ideas on their own beyond having an annual idea competition and get this bunch of ideas and filter them down to no more than 10. I say honestly for any organization, if you've got 10 innovative things you're working on, that's probably too many unless you are a really sizable organization. And things that sit in that box for customers are often, you know, should I build a new digital bank? Should I build a new digital product, which is a bit different to a, you know, building an entirely new bank? Should I do end-to-end -end unsecured lending? That would be a digital product, and I'm going to do it you know, from the customer backwards. It's going to be fully automated. It's not going to touch our old systems. It's going to be approved within seconds. You know, should that sit in there? And then you're probably going to want something in there around AI and IoT and data in terms of getting better at that. So there's a bunch of things that sit in that box. And this is the box where you need to accept that not everything you do will work. And so then you need to think about how you build, at the very top of the organization, mechanisms to accept that some of these hypotheses we had, some of the money we're going to spend on this, will not pay dividends. And the reality is we know that 70% of the time, new ideas, new startups fail, new projects we roll out fail. So we know in our minds that it's impossible to think that you will get success all of the time, but we need to embed that at the beginning of this. Otherwise, the first time something fails in that sort of innovation journey, we'll kill the people, we'll kill the product, we'll never do it again, it will impact every other idea we have. So we need to build those frameworks around risk acceptance. And then the final box in the grid is, when does something graduate out of these innovation ideas into being material? And I work with customers on what materiality means for them. And sometimes it's like 10% of revenue is material. It's, uh, you know, it's 10 million customers. It's, I want my MPS to do this. I want, uh, I want when it's got to proven cost to income ratio below 40%, that's, that's, that means it's ready to go for me. And so this final box is, when do you sort of scale things? When is it your next billion dollar business? And what I found there, I was with a customer in the US a few days ago, and I said, so how are you doing with this? You've been doing it for a couple of years now. How are you going with the top left box, this box around materiality? What's in there? And they said, oh, we've got four or five ideas in there. And what I found consistently is, honestly, if you've got more than one, I get nervous. Because if you've got more than one, they start to fight each other for top level focus and for funding, particularly if you're new at this. So I tend to say be really careful when you graduate something from an idea to being sort of a material, sustainable, you know, lifelong business for you and really protect it. And that's not to say you don't put another idea into that bucket, but when you introduce the second idea, you know, one is launching a digital product and then another one is launching a new business in a new country or an insurance business, be careful they don't fight each other. And if you really care about both, 
then you need to have separate governance and separate funding and really not make one trade off from the other, which is a typical sort of challenge that these firms have. And then finally, I would say, even if you do all of this, even if you do amazing customer research, even if you build the best tech, even if you partner with Apple, if your organization isn't moving fast, if it isn't accepting failure, if it isn't a place that looks like a good home for the next generations of talent, if it isn't a place where I can have flexibility around working, then you're not gonna have the talent base to do any of what I described. So yes, customer first is key, but I think culture comes even before doing any of this. If you don't have the culture to support everything I described, then I wouldn't do this. With that, I'm gonna hand back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darren. I'll get you to wait on stage as we seamlessly bring four chairs out here for our mega panel discussion. The questions have been flying in thick and fast on the app for all four of our panellists. Some of these are directed to individuals, but panellists, if when you join us you want to um, answer the questions in particular, uh, if you want to um, jump in as well, don't be shy, let us know your thoughts. So we've got Amanda, Anthony, Bianca and Darren joining us on stage for a 20 minute Q&A. and I'll start with you, Anthony. There was a question I was going to ask that merges pretty nicely with a question that came in from the audience. I was going to ask, why does Australia need another bank? From what I understand, we've already got quite a few. Someone else asked, with so many neobanks emerging in the market, how is 86400 different? The space is already getting crowded before it started. So meld those two together yep. into a big so question. Two, two great questions. I think, firstly, uh, Australia doesn't need another bank if it's just going to be the same as all of the other banks. It has to be doing something uh, different. Otherwise, why have one? You know, th th there are too many. And in terms of what is that difference, I think it comes from the point I tried to make, which is you can use technology to provide a much lower cost solution and a better experience to customers. Uh, which then comes into the second part of your question, which is, if there are a number of new banks coming in, what differentiates them? And can I say, because we're amongst friends here, aren't we? It'll, it'll go no further. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the reality is, you know, everybody talks about how they are different, but the reality is we're all using big data, data analytics, artificial intelligence, delivered through better technology to deliver a better customer experience. So we are all trying to do broadly the same thing. Now, publicly, we'll say, yes, we're very different, but, but broadly, it's the same thing. The difference is not in the idea or the ideation. It's in the execution. Everything comes down to how well you execute it. And yeah, I think we are the only bank currently of the new entrants currently in the market with transaction accounts, savings accounts. Great stuff. On the topic of trust, Darren, I'll get you to reiterate the point you were making, because Amanda was out of the room for a couple of seconds. So I want her to answer this. You were saying, I get the impression, the trust window is closing, but big players are still in the ascendancy in some ways. I want to marry that with a question about, to Bianca and, and Amanda, if this new technology does allow big players to start winning back in the trust space, where smaller players are usually done it more face to face, what do the smaller players do if that's the case? So Darren, can you just remake your point about the trust, that tr sort of trust balance? Yeah, so I think, uh the incumbents still have the trust today, despite the fact that many of these digital players have come up. If I look at the UK with Monzo and Starling, people like them, but they haven't moved over to them being their core account. So you still have a lot of the trust today, but I think there's this window of trust where if incumbents don't transform themselves and provide better solutions, all of the things that my colleague just mentioned, then the trust will move over, right? Over time, people care more about the experience than than sort of trust, but I have to go to a branch. So I think you do need to provide a response. Otherwise, the next few generations, they're going to care a lot less about trust, I think, than the people we're talking about today. So Amanda Bianca, we've got a, a, a trust window closing at the same time a technology platform expanding that might allow the bigger players to strengthen their trust. How do you see that balance, Amanda? 
Or, and Bianca. Oh, Bianca. Well, I mean, look, uh, for a start, I actually think in the Australian market, there's probably three types of banks when we're thinking about trust. We've got the big players at the moment who obviously saw the Royal Commission uh, fall out mostly. We've got a lot of the neo banks, the digital banks emerging, who really have to try and formulate trust and sort of earn it in the market at this point in time. They don't necessarily have that kind of... Um, uh, trusted institution, uh, do I really trust these banks with my money? And then we have the third type of bank as well, which is often the community member bank or the smaller banks who have developed trust in a different way, a reputation that they're there for more than profit but for members. So I think we've got trust playing out differently at this point in time across three different types of institutions. But uh, I agree, the trust balance isn't static. We've got the big four trying desperately hard to rework, redo, rebuild. Uh, we'll have the neo and digital banks as they uh, receive more customers and we, if we're fortunate we won't have any negative media. Uh, sort of the concerns about them eventually over time will also dissipate. So I think for that third category of banks, the community and member banks, who at this point in time probably are winning on the trust equation, the question is, is what else are you going to deliver in terms of differentiation in the future once all of that rebalances? That would probably be... Bianca? Yeah, so from my perspective, I think we are moving to an era where there will be solutions that are delivered to all uh, consumers and customers that will level the playing field. So all, all organisations will be offering a new benchmark of um, digital and data products that will help build trust. So there will be that um, level of playing field. But I think what's What's also just as important is culture or decision making within organisations and I think that the organisations that have been spending many, many years uh, putting their customers first and thinking about business decisions and priorities in a way that really is putting customers first, they will still have the edge because whilst technology is a simple fix and, and can be switched on relatively simply, I think that the decisions that boards and management teams need to make around prioritising what kind of solutions will be delivered and sometimes at the risk of not making as much money and we've heard some examples of those kind of things today. Organisations that have had a history of putting customers first and making those kind of decisions through that lens will always have a leading edge. I, I, if I may, I would, I, I would take issue with your point about the neobanks and their inability and yet unproven ability to make profit. If I take uh, Metrobank, which was the first new challenger bank in the UK, um, I think we were able to prove that you can give a great customer service and you can be profitable. And within six years, created a business with a market cap of five and a half billion dollars. So I think new entrants can carve out market share and can be profitable. If we take Monzo, Monzo now has three million customers in the UK in a within less than six years, um, their cost per customer acquisition and losses per customer are declining dramatically. And having talked to them, the only thing that prevents them being profitable tomorrow is their decision to keep on growing their customer numbers. If they stopped growing, they would be, would be profitable tomorrow. So I think it, it is possible for new entrants to take market share by giving customers a better product or a better service or a better experience, by proving that they do provide that second kind of trust, the associated trust of putting them first, but that it has to be that pro profit is a byproduct. And, and back to something I said in my presentation, I absolutely believe that some of the big banks have just lost sight of the customer. They think they're just in business to make money. Darren, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, look, most of the digital banks are not profitable, so I agree there are some that are doing it really, really well. Uh, you know, I take my hat off to the Chinese players, actually, because they're doing it incredibly well. Uh, but I absolutely support what you said about the incumbents. I, uh, you know, they're so far from thinking about the customer and what the customer needs, and all too often it comes down to dollars and cents before you get anywhere near building something that is actually going to help the customer. And so my advice is you have to shake that, whether that's building outside of the existing bank or partnering or investing in fintechs, whatever it is, you've got to break that mold of thinking about we need a return within six months or a year or, you know, just being obsessed with those sort of ROI um, scenarios because it takes time to get like the digital banks, right? And if you're an incumbent, you start from a worse position than a blank canvas because you've got to unlearn a bunch of things. 
And so you need time and patience and persistence and a maniac focus on the customer, you know, which is hard in these incumbent firms, I think. Well, let's ask a couple of questions on that front. Anthony, a two-part question, neither part of which you might want to answer, which I like. Someone asks, if you were to join a traditional bank today with its legacy infrastructure and challenges, how would you approach a transformation to compete with the likes of 86400? So my ex-business partner's guy called Vernon Hill in the UK. Some of you may know Vernon Hill. He was unique for always carrying a small Yorkshire Terrier called Duffy, <laughs> Sir Duffield. Everywhere he went, uh, Duffy would go to. And he was asked at a conference exactly that question, but to give it a sort of edge, they said, if we kidnapped your dog, Duffy, and we didn't give it back to you until you fixed the retail at Big Bang, what would you do? And he said, I guess my dog's dead. <laughs> okay, second part of the question. <laughs> Metro and Atom, they're, they're, they're two raging successes in the UK, but full honesty session, fess up. When you, when you took on the big ones with these new players, what was the biggest mistake, false assumption, oversight that you made in either of the ventures? What's something you did get wrong looking back that you could have done better? Yeah, I think, I don't think there was any single big thing we got wrong. I think there's a whole bunch of small things that yeah, collectively would, would be a big thing. But I think you can't go far wrong if you put the customer first. And I think, to, again, to the point you just made a little bit earlier, um, one of the things we did, and this is back in the days, this is 10 years ago now, was we put coin counting machines into every, every branch of Metrobank. In fact, we put two in because they used to break down a lot because of foreign objects put in with your coins. So you know, what do you have in your pocket that makes these machines break down where you put your coins in? In America, it's bullets. Um, <laughs> and these machines cost about $30,000, all presented up with a bit of software for a game. So two machines, $60,000. Uh, call it 60 stores now, you know, that's three and a half million, four million dollars of investment in something with absolutely no customer return. There's no financial return on these things. And I think the one thing we did well, and we did less well when we lost sight of this, was say, everything is about the customer experience. There doesn't have to be an absolute ROI on every single thing. So my question would be, would your business spend 5 million or 50 million or 500 million, depending on how big it is, just on improving the customer experience? Amanda, when, when AT talks about customers and consumers, you say that the consumers are not fully on the journey yet, uh, despite the fact that there's a lot of change across the industry. In other areas and industries you've looked at, is that, is that typical that the, the consumers are a bit slower to get on the train in some ways? Yeah, look, I think it is, and that's probably getting to the heart of what we're talking about here too with digital banks, isn't it? Because we can see what's coming in terms of transition, but the consumers are slower. Um, when it comes to open banking, for example, you know, we're trying to talk to consumers about what the kind of services and products are that they might see in the future, and we can see that they're still focused very much on these kind of basic risk issues about, you know, how's my data being secure? Or if we talk about the new digital banks, they're talking about these basic risk issues about will my money be safe? But in other industries we've worked in, um, and in fact I like your examples about Qantas, so I worked with Qantas pretty closely for about 20 years, for example, we've seen they've had to transform. We see that customers are always much slower and sort of much more risk adverse than we'd like them to be when we introduce new technologies. Um, an example I might give, uh, I don't know how, I feel really old when I tell this story, but I don't know if you remember when you used to go and check in at airports, you'd have to go and stand in a queue and wait for somebody to hand you a boarding pass for no reason at all, like, you'd have to do it. And then of course the whole of check-ins now being totally transformed with the idea of self-check-in. But when you talk to customers before that technology was introduced, none of them could really see the benefits, but all of them could see the risks, uh, sort of about security and who will know, you know, if I'm really me and what will go on. It took about a year 
better. And then people started to adjust. And then, you know, look at, you know, 10 to 15 years later, none of us could imagine standing in a queue. So I think we're still in this transition period for digital banking, transition period for the new services. But the exciting thing for customers is it's going to be a world of fabulous CX and a lot of differentiated brands if we can just get through this time and take them with us and possibly not have any major hiccups, so not have a digital bank go down or not have a huge data breach. And then I think we'll, we'll see something really exciting in four to five well, all years. All the UK experience tells us that customers have no idea what open banking is. That's right. That it's, you know, it's the big banks would be voting, for, like Turkey's voting for Christmas to introduce it. So, and, and I think your point about Starling and Monzo was very good in the sense that they were built to be open banking ready and open banking has just taken longer to come to market mm. than they anticipated. Uh, and they didn't have some of the basic products to bridge that particular gap. Um, so I think, it, and everything I see here is exactly the same, which is customers don't understand what open banking means. The regulator is still struggling to get their head around what it actually means. Um, and the big banks, there's what's in it for them? Yeah, I was just going to add to that that I think that if you approach open banking from a compliance perspective and talk about it as a lawyer or a banker and you try and say, ask consumers, is that what they want? They just glaze over. That's not what they're interested in. Um, but if you go to um, India or China where open banking or the the offerings and solutions that that come from an open um, data environment are, if you go to those areas and you see the solutions that are being offered and the appetite for consumers to take them up, it, it's absolutely clear that uh, people want their lifestyle to be simpler, their lives to be simpler, and they're, they're happy to take on any solutions that will provide that to them with the security, but I agree, security is, is something that's important now, but as people get hooked on these kind of solutions, that diminishes. So uh, I do think that education is important, but I think it will be more when people start experiencing these products than the take-up will really happen. One question here that might be our final one for time, but I, I noticed it because it came, I'll put it to the entire panel, but I'll direct it to you, Darren, because it, it came through as, Darren, for FS, in capital letters, I thought, gee, settle down. And, yeah, for fuck's sake. No, no, but I think it means financial services. Darren, for financial serv Darren, for financial services orgs to look to change their offerings to solutions to customer rather than traditional financial products and services, what organisational changes do these places need to make? UAT as well have built some of these sort of organisations that are on the cutting edge. What capability do organisations need to move this way of thinking? Uh, I think incumbents have a really hard time because I always use the example of flying a plane. Like I have this emotional contract with my airline that when I go there, the one thing I want to do is land the other end, right? I, I, want the, I want the entertainment to work, I want the meal to be nice, but I want to land. None of that matters if I don't land and I think it's hard. I wouldn't want the pilot and the stewardess to start innovating around my flights, you know, when they're on it, right? And so I do have a lot of empathy for the banks with these people trying to keep a bank running and trying to satisfy ever-changing demands from the regulator, etc. And so I think if I were the leadership, I would ask myself some really hard questions around, do I think my organization can change to work in the new way? You know, sort of the Monzo Starling, you know, Chinese banks, the digital provider ways. Do I believe we can do it? Because it comes down to execution. Do I believe I can work in that way? And I think you have to be honest and not be sort of ego driven because everybody naturally believes you can do everything. And I think that would lead a lot of them to say, you know, maybe we can't do it and we need to partner. Maybe we're better to be investing in these firms. Maybe we're better to build it outside of our organization. Because uh, I think it's too hard for many organizations, particularly the big ones, to change. Anthony? Yeah, I think, I think there's a, a real management challenge, which is people who start businesses, entrepreneurs, are usually passionate about something. And it's not usually about making money. It's about wanting to change something, wanting to do something better. And as I mentioned earlier, the profit is a byproduct. I think one of the, the key cultural challenges in the big banks is, and, and I saw a campaign recently from somebody knocking people who worked in banks. I think the vast majority of people who work in banks turn up every day and go to work to do a great job, the best job they possibly can within the constraints of the organization they work in. And I'm like, the, big, the big four, 
next 10 and so forth, I think people are generally really care about what they're doing. So the challenges at the very top. Entrepreneurs' rewards are based upon giving customers something better. I think the very top management in the big banks are rewarded regardless of what happens, um, which is why I quite like going into a category which is run by people who didn't start the businesses, who get paid large amounts of money for working from nine till five. You want to say anything? Um, I, I think I was also going to say, and I agree, I think we, we just, when we all face into that challenge of how can a big bank pivot, we sort of feel grateful we're not the ones having to handle it. I think one of the issues um, as well is that often when we're looking at this kind of how do you become more customer centric in significant organisations that have a lot of legacy systems is that kind of customer centricity sits at the kind of the client facing the front office functions <coughs> and in actual fact that if that's where it only sits then the bank itself or any organisation is truly not going to transform. You need to have your front office but also your middle functions, your HR, your finance, your, your back office functions as well totally aligned with the idea about customer centricity. So it, to do it, it takes a total organisation transformation and I think people just get stuck at the front and know they can't devolve all the way through the organisation and that's where we hit the challenges. So small disruptors don't have that problem. They start again from scratch. So it's hard and that to me is one of the issues, not just the leadership. Tremendous observations. Please give our panel a big round of applause. Thank you so much, Bianca, Darren, Amanda and Anthony.